Welcome to all of you joining this uh, TPC webinar on a Friday afternoon. Um, a huge number registered for this, so we're just waiting for everyone to join. Um, uh, and then there will be underway just after two o'clock. Um, if you haven't registered for next week, it's a bit of a digital week next week, a whole host of things starting on uh, Monday and Tuesday. Um, there's some really good uh, membership sessions Wednesday and Lucy Costello on Thursday proving popular with her the current climate for online donations. So if you haven't registered for those, head on over to the TPC site and we'll be underway shortly with Katie Rains and after the interval. Okay, folks, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this Friday afternoon TPC webinar series. Uh, webinar, it is after the interval um, with Katie Rains from Indigo looking at the work she has been uh, conducting, or Indigo been conducting on audience um, views about coming back to places of entertainment. He's gone way too far, look at that. Um, so, before we get going, um, we thought we'd just run a little bit of a poll to see who we have in. We had over 550 registrations for this. So, before we get going, let's have a little bit of a poll and see who we've got in. So, three questions for you. Um, have you participated in this survey the, uh, after the uh, interval survey? Is your venue, uh, whereabouts is your venue? And finally, uh, what best describe what kind of what best describes your venue? I can see lots of votes coming in there. So, uh, have you participated in the survey? Uh, where it, what's the location of your venue or organisation, and which dis best describes? And we are two hundred and fifty votes out of four hundred. So they're piling in. We'll stop it after about seventy five percent. So, get those votes in now. Okay, so we'll end it there, and we should sh I should share the results on screen. So, um, yes, forty-two percent of you, yes, have, have participated in the survey. No, forty-four uh, percent. No, but would like to. Fourteen. Well, I'm sure Kate too would love to chat to you about that. Is your venue in the UK? Seventy-three percent. Yes. Uh, outside UK, one. Outside Europe, one percent. And not a, not a venue. Twenty-four percent. Which best describes your organisation? Uh, theatre or console, 40. Performing arts, 15. Producing theatre, 9. Museum, 4. Supplier, 10%. And industry and other bodies, 21%. So, get an idea now of, of, uh, of who's in. A bit of quick housekeeping. Um, that's me at the top, Andrew Thomas. I run the Ticketing Professionals Conference, um, which we had to postpone for this year, unfortunately, because of COVID. Um, we'll be back in 21. This session is being recorded um, and we're YouTube streaming it and it will be available to watch on demand on YouTube after um, this afternoon. We have a presentation um, by Katie. We're probably not going to have any discussion points and then we'll go into a Q&A and the Q&A box, it should be at the bottom or top of your screen um, where you can pop a question in. You can also um, select the option to um, upvote a question as well. Um, so you can look at other people's questions, give it a thumbs up, that that's the top of the pile. We'll probably answer those first. Um, to those of you raising your hands as attendees, we can't interact with you that way. So pop it in a question. If you've got something to say or I've got an issue, pop it in the, in the, in the Q&A. But um, 
we have got a lot to get to, a lot of insights. So I'm now going to hand over to Katie. Katie, over to you. Oh. Uh, and I've unmuted you as well. We've, we've ended up right at the end of the presentation as well, which really... Well then, whiz all the way back. No one look, no one look. No, hang on. Let me just stop the share. Hang on. Sorry. Okay. It's you don't gonna... want to ruin anything. Bear with me. Can you, can you see that screen? No, I can't see anything at the moment. Okay, right. Bear with me then. Sorry, guys. This is a really bad start. Okay, here we go. So, how do I share that again now? Because I've disappeared. Here we go. So, let's share go. screen and then, yeah. Let's try again. There we go. Look, we're all cooking on gas now. Katie, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to not see you all, but to have you all on the on the webinar. And um, thank you so much for, for coming along. Um, as you know, uh, six weeks ago, the UK went into lockdown and of course, all the, the theatres and venues closed across the country. And I've been having a lot of conversations with um, multiple cultural organisations in the run up to that. And I observed a range of responses at that time. Denial, many were completely taken by surprise at the need to cancel performances, still thinking that it was probably months away. Um, some were just in panic at the sheer scale of the feat in cancelling everything um, and almost paralysed by that, unable to think beyond, oh my god, we've just got to cancel all these performances. Um, and then some were kind of in the blind faith mode uh, that after a few weeks in lockdown, we'd all be open again as normal, probably by June or July. And very few of the, the leaders of cultural organisations and marketers, who are the ones I typically talk to, um, very few of them were, were really ready to face the prospect, and frankly, who can blame them, that we, we might be out of action for a lot longer than that. Um, and they were all in what I've been calling whack-a-mole mode, that there is so much energy being expended on just dealing with the here and now, the cancellations, the, the kind of shock, um, of everything that was going on, that there just wasn't the bandwidth to start thinking about what they might need to know in one or two months time. At the same time as that, I saw lots of sector surveys flying around, so which is brilliant that people were asking the sector what they needed. And that's very valid and very much required, but I couldn't see any evidence of anyone asking audiences what they were thinking and what they needed. And I realized that if we were gonna be in a position to have the intelligence that we needed, when the leaders of the cultural organizations emerged from whack-a-mole and were now ready to start thinking about this stuff that we needed to act really quickly. So I went about working out what the questions were that I would most need answered if I was in their shoes. And of course I wasn't in whack-a-mole mode. So I had the, the luxury of being able to think about that um, at that time, not having to worry about people's jobs, etc. We made the survey available free to any cultural organisation who wanted to use it. All they needed to do was to send the link that we supplied to them to their customers via email. And we even supplied a draft email in case organisations had put their marketing teams on furlough. Um, and then the particip participating organisations were able to see the results from their own audiences in real time. And this is something that they, the ones I've spoken to have found really valuable because there was that urgency of needing that information quickly. There was one exec director that rang me and said, we sent it out at nine o'clock this morning. By lunchtime, we'd had a thousand responses and by three o'clock I was briefing the board. So it's that kind of urgent um, information and intelligence that, that organizations needed and they've been able to get very quickly. Before I start showing you the results, I just want to take a minute to say how amazing it has been over the last few weeks to work in this sector. There's so much kind of negative stuff going on at the moment. I just want a moment to be positive. 
These organisations, over 200 of them now, just took this and ran with it really quickly. They didn't tiddle around with the questions. You know, usually as a consultant, you're used to people that, oh, well, no, we need our question done slightly differently because we are different from everyone else. Um, there was none of that. People were just willing to trust me and know that we needed, in order to do it at scale and at speed, we needed the questions to be identical, even if that meant a little bit of trade-off in some cases. And I'm sure some of the questions could be worded slightly better. And I'm sure for individual organizations, they would rather have worded them in a slightly different way. But I really appreciate them just going with it. And the other thing I would say is their willingness to be brave, to be brave enough to ask the audience these questions, knowing full well that they may not like the answers. So hats off to all of them. Um, and the audiences have been amazing too. So I was quite worried to start off with that, that placing fear in our audiences, this, that they're just by suggesting that we might not be open for a while, might actually frighten them. Um, and that we might get some backlash from audiences um, by asking them what are quite difficult questions. But in fact, the opposite has happened. Many organisations have called me to tell to, to say that it's been such a fantastic audience engagement activity for them. And the response rates that we've got of between about 40 and 50 percent from the emails that have gone out have verified that. Um, and finally, before I move on to the results, the prize for the nicest customer of all goes to a customer of the Royal Albert Hall, who, having received the survey and completed it, looked me up and sent me a lovely email thanking me for doing this. So that was just delightful. So I'm gonna show you today what we're calling wave one because we started collecting results to this survey on the 16th of April. Um, so these results were pulled at the three week point and we're hoping to pull wave two uh, for the next three week uh, block. We've had 86 and a half thousand audience responses um, which in itself it shows the strength of feeling in, in the sector and the level of support from audiences. It is um, the, 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 the sample, the profile of the sample is a frequent uh, culture enga culturally engaged audience. This is entirely deliberate. We wanted to know what the people who we would most rely on to come back to our venues quickly we're thinking. Now, there could be an argument, there probably is an argument if we go on with this to start looking at less frequent attenders. Um, but at the moment, that's, that's, that was the, the brief. And most of the organisations sent out emails to people who'd been in the last couple of years and had been at least twice. So not somebody who came to Panto five years ago kind of thing. Um, possibly because of that, it's a slightly older demographic, um, as you probably expect. 192 organisations were in, in, in the first wave. We've now got over 200 participating, but in this data set, there's 192. Um, the organisation, 78% of the uh, responses from the organisations came from organisations based in England. And as you'll see, we've got some from Wales, Scotland, um, some touring companies and, and a few from Ireland in there as well. And it's the majority of the um, responses came from emails that had gone out from a theatre or an arts centre. So these are the areas that the after the interval survey covered questions about uh, during lockdown, questions asking people if they're booking now for events, when they think they might return, questions around safety and comfort, refunds, exchanges and credits, and philanthropic giving. We actually created two versions of the survey, um, identical apart from that last box. So organisations that weren't charities simply didn't ask the last set of questions, but everything else was exactly the same. So lockdown, during lockdown, are you missing the opportunity to attend live events at the moment? And of course you would expect this, this sample to say exactly what they've said, that 93% of them are absolutely missing it. But I think it's worth remembering because it's nice to have some positives coming out. What are you most looking forward to about coming back to events in the future? So three quarters of them, it's all about that buzz of a live event. Um, but I think it's really interesting that over half say they're looking forward 
to supporting their local venue again. Now, maybe that's unsurprising again, given that these are the most culturally engaged attenders. Um, but, you know, it's way above making a night, a night of it, dinner and a show, or spending time with family and friends. So I think that's really encouraging for the future. I should say all of these graphs, you may not be able to see these graphs brilliantly here, and we are gonna whiz through them. The whole report with all the graphs in is available on our website to download. So don't panic about scribbling it all down now. Booking now for events. Are you actively booking now for events in the future? And at the time we took this survey, there, was, there were still plenty of shows on sale. Only 17% of people were actively booking. And half of, of those were for events not before November. So most of those things that they were booking for were further afield. When will they come back? So if you had to say now, when you think you'll be ready to start booking, so not when you will come back, but when you'll be ready to start booking. So this was only asked to the people who said they weren't booking now. So if you're not booking now, when would you be ready to think about booking? And 41% say they're not even going to consider it for at least four months. And then we've, we've made them choose between these three options. Which of these would you choose? How do, which one of these statements best fits how you're currently feeling? And just seeing venues reopen again would only be enough for, for about 20%. Yeah, that in itself. So if the government said, yes, venues, you can reopen, um, that in itself would not be enough um, to reassure these people to just come back. Well, not more than 19% of them anyway. And interestingly, and not very surprisingly, um, that drops down to 14% for the over 65s. Um, and, and it's still not very high at 26% for the under 35s. So I know a lot of people have been thinking, ah, well, you know, the young people, they're really gung-ho, they'll come out, let's just pivot towards doing stuff for young people. And there's definitely an argument for that. But let's also be re realistic about the fact that only a quarter of young people would just come because the venue had opened again. Safety and comfort. So would any of the following help you to feel safe and comfortable going to an event at a venue again? And three quarters of them are looking for, it seems that they would be looking for some form of social distancing measures, which is utterly terrifying, isn't it? Um, if that's what we would have to do to get them back. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the three that, that come out there, avoiding long queues, limiting capacity, flipping nightmare, and spacing seats two metres apart. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but this is what they're saying. And I was interested to also find out if there were some sorts of venues that they would feel happier coming back before others. So again, not surprising, but good to have some numbers on it. This scale goes from zero to 100. So nothing scores over half. No, you know, this isn't a ringing endorsement that, that actually they feel comfortable coming to large outdoor events. They would just feel more comfortable coming back to those before, say, a large standing venue. Um, you have to also bear in mind the demographic of this audience that maybe they would never go to a large standing venue because loads of them are old. Um, so we just have to bear that in mind. But, but that's quite interesting, I think, to look at that. Um, and it will be interesting to see if those numbers change over time. Now, on a ticketing forum, I think this one is fascinating. So how important, again, the scale goes from zero to 100 here. How important is each of these things in influencing your decision to book for future events? So for me, this is about what do we need to be saying and doing for audiences to be booking now for events that may be a year or 15, 18 months away, because we really want to get that cash flowing back into the, into the organisations. So the ability to receive a full refund should the event be cancelled is very, very important. Now, I know a lot of organisations have been doing that um, 
And so that's what people expect. But the next two, I think, are really interesting. The ability to receive a credit if I am unwell. So this isn't about the event being cancelled by the promoter or the venue. This is about me saying I'm not I'm not well or I'm not able or frankly I'm feeling a bit wobbly or the person that I was going to come with is feeling a bit wobbly and so we've booked for this but we really don't want to come anymore can I please have a credit that I could use on future events or could I exchange my tickets for another performance in the future if I'm unable to do that and you know 75 and 74 that's really high and I suppose one of the things that I'm interested in as, a, as an industry and as a sector is whether that's the elephant in the room that we're now willing to talk about, because I know a lot of organisations do offer that, in which case I think they need to put it right up the front of their communications. But I know a lot of organisations don't. And I understand all the reasons for that, uh, the promoters and the relationships and the whose money it is and all that stuff. But I do think we need to talk about it. And then the final section was around um, philanthropic support. So, you know, if we have to start asking you for additional money to help help with a recovery fund, say, how, you know, transactionally, how is the best way for us to do that? And of course, they would much rather have a voluntary donation at the point of sale than having levies per booking or levies per ticket. Um, and increasing ticket prices was the least attractive option, perhaps unsurprisingly. And then the final question was, which sort of initiatives, if you were able to support something financially, philanthropically, which are the things that, that you would feel most affinity with? And the two that have come out strongest are basically celebrating NHS or care workers who've put themselves at risk, um, and enabling people who can't now afford to come to access tickets. So for me, I think this has all sorts of implications for perhaps pay it forward type schemes, adding another ticket to the basket, um, which obviously isn't a ticket, it's a conceptual ticket. Um, but rather than just sort of catch all at the end, actually giving people a tangible way of donating to something that they think is going to make a tangible difference to, to an individual who's been affected by this. So the other question that we wanted to ask now we've got three weeks worth of data is, are attitudes changing week by week? And the answer is a bit, because all of this survey happened during the same period of lockdown in the UK. So this was before Boris Johnson's announcement that things were going to start loosening. So it will be interesting to look at the next three weeks to see if there's any difference. Um, the percentage of those booking tickets fell slightly, but maybe that's not very surprising given that there were less things on sale, fewer things on sale. Those who were booking were booking for things that were further off. And the, the lack of confidence about returning hasn't changed. So we haven't seen any uplift in that yet. Um, I would hope that as we start, we continue to track this, um, that we can start to see that all of those metrics start to change. So what are we doing next? What are the next steps? Well, first of all, I would encourage you to use this data. So we've made the, report, the full report and the at a glance findings available on our website to download. So please use them, share them, do whatever you want with them. Um, with the lovely Chris unit from One Further, um, we, I say we, he has developed an interactive dashboard that allows you to look at the results of this survey and compare by region, um, by type of organization and to play with the data a bit and we will keep updating that as we go on as well. So again, that's on our website for you to uh, play with. Um, and we'd encourage you obviously to get involved. So the survey is still open. So we've got wave two of the same survey going on um, for another two weeks. We're also developing a version two, um, which will track most of the same metrics, but also look at some some other areas, which I'll talk about in a minute in my final thoughts. 
Um, and if you want to get involved, you just go to our website and there's a form there to complete and we can get you all set up. Now this is the bit I'm supposed to speak at, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. So before Katie wraps up with five thoughts, um, if you want to head into Q&A, we've already got 12 in there and I've been furiously answering them by text. Have a read through of what's already in there. Give it a thumb, give the questions a thumbs up if you think they're more relevant to you than, than, than other ones. And then pop your questions in there and we'll be coming to Q&A very shortly. So head in with your questions and we'll try and get through those as quickly as we can. Sorry, Katie, over to you again. Okay, so five thoughts just to finish. Um, I, you know, I think we all need time to digest this data and this information. Um, but these are my kind of top of head thoughts at the moment. I'll probably change my mind by next week, but this is what I think at the moment. So for those who think we can just put shows on sale and carry on as normal, um, just don't, is kind of my short answer. I just don't think we can do that much as I would love to. I just don't think we're in that place. Um, for those who say, oh, that's all very well, but we can't possibly make social distance performances stack up in our venue, either economically or with the physical layout of the building that we have or whatever it is. Um, I'm not here to tell you that you should be doing this and I'm not here to make a judgment per organisation. It will be for each organisation to decide that for themselves. What I would say is um, that I, I don't think the data yet tells us when we would be able to put those performance, when, when those performances could be for. So even if we could put them on sale now, I don't think the data yet um, sh shows us clearly enough when it will be okay to go back to business as previously. Um, so I think we need to, to keep listening, uh, keep tracking what audiences are saying and, and be ready. But in the meantime, I think those organizations need to get working now on their messages of reassurance. So what are they going to say to people now to persuade them to book for something a long way off? What are you going to do? We need to get to grips with the whole ticket exchange and credit thing, in my view, and we need to get working on that now. For those organisations who think they can do socially distanced performances and are going to have a crack at that, um, I think we need to know a little bit more about whether the trade-offs that would be required by the venue would outweigh the, uh, the reassurances and the things we're putting in place to keep people safe. So for example, um, this survey is given as an idea of the sorts of things people would be looking for in terms of reduced capacity, um, social distance seating and avoiding long queues and you know possibly hand sanitizer and things like that. But what we didn't ask, and we're going to ask in the next one, is whether um, the implications of doing that, if it meant that we couldn't open the bar and the show had to not be with an interval, um, and you're basically coming into an auditorium with not very much atmosphere, um, would those things outweigh that and on, on balance make you less likely to come? So I think we need to understand what audiences think about that. Um, I also think that if venues who, who are attempting to do social distance performances, I think there might need to be an industry, a clear industry set of standards that we can sort of kite mark for audiences so that they're reassured about what to expect when they go to a venue like that. For those who think that other formats are the answer, so perhaps outdoor work or digital work, again, I think we need to really understand what the appetite is for those from people who were previously attending venues. You know, are they all going to see digital work or outdoor work as a suitable replacement for what they've had? Or to what extent are they willing to give it a go? But of course, the crucial question is, what, what, to what extent are they willing to pay for them? So we need to know that. And again, that's something that we want to try and find out. And then finally, for ticketing suppliers, um, I, I think I've seen an awful lot of um, people coming up with very whizzy socially distant seating plans and all sorts of other things. For me, I would really value the ticketing suppliers getting their heads around how they can help us with some of those pay it forward schemes, um, really helping with persuasive fundraising asks and helping to facilitate really easy ticket exchange and credit options for customers 
um, so that we can provide that reassurance. And there we go, Katie, while you just grab a, a, a slurp of water, because you're going to do a lot of talking in the next half an hour, I think. We're going to flick over and I've got the screen control back. Now we've already got a massive number of questions in the uh, in the Q&A, 30, and I've already been answering some of them. Comments and comments and discussion, if you can put it on Twitter, at, you know, and there's at Indigo Limited, at Ticketing Profs, hashtag after the interval, um, then it'd be great to carry this conversation on because I think there's a lot, I was having conversations today about this. I think it will go on for some time, but hopefully Kate is rehydrated and we have to battle this Q&A, which is currently standing at 30, Katie. So how, how do you fancy your chances? OK, let's go. Right. Now, as is normal on these, we never we always ignore the top one first. So Katie Elson's got 97 thumbs up, but we'll miss her out for now. We will come back to her. And there's one that caught my eye down. Is there data, any data, anonymous attendee, is there any data with regards to pantomime? So is there anything in there we can particularly, I mean, I, when I read it, I saw about December and November performances, and I'm assuming that's Panto, but is there any data specifically in there? Well, no, because we didn't ask about pantomime. So we have to, we have to surmise about that in terms of uh, when people are booking. I mean, you would, you would expect that the 24% of people that are booking, that are booking, sorry, the 20, the, of the 17% of people who are booking, 24% of them are booking for events in November and December and 26 in January onwards. And you would expect a big chunk of those to be panto, wouldn't you? I would have thought, but no, we haven't specifically asked about pantomime. Okay, okay. So that's an interesting one maybe for that round two, which leads us on nicely to what I'm gonna try and sum up and whiz through these Q&A, because there's a lot of, would it be possible, dot, dot, dot. And Katie is the one there um, at the top with 99 thumbs up. I'm sure someone will give her one more so she can say she got to 100. Would it be possible to add a question to the next phase of surveys about whether people would pay for streamed content? And if so, how much would they pay? Uh, yes, and that's definitely in development in version two. We're just trying to figure out the best way to ask the question. But yes, it's in there. Okay, so thank you, Katie, for that one. Ended up on 103 thumbs up. And going further down in the same category while we're here, could we dot, dot, dot. Uh, Matt Pinches asks, a third of our output is, in a, is, a, is for our open air season. Would it be possible to add a question about attending small uh, events or outdoor theatre events? Well, interestingly, I think when I said about my kind of five things um, about people who think that other formats are the answer, I think that's one of the things, I don't think we just need to make version two about digital. I think we need to be asking people more generally about what are the sorts of formats they would consider attending arts in. And I think outdoor needs to be one of them. And I know I've had conversations with um, the, the outdoor network, arts network people and all kinds of things. And, and obviously, they're very excited about the possibilities. So I think we absolutely, and then for me, we absolutely need to be finding that out alongside digital because it's it could be a real option. Okay, so, uh, same subject kind of now, uh, Shamai Nia, who says, uh, is there any way to take into account the different approaches the different and devolved governments in the UK are taking to lifting lockdown? Does any aspect of the survey touch on this? So again, me, I'm based in Wales. Um, you know, I can do certain things in England. I'm not actually allowed to get to England to partake in those. So is there any thought about possible devolved differences in the administrations? Um, yes, well, for a start, we've, we've had a look at the data by region. And of course, remember that when th this data was um, submitted, there were very few differences between England, Wales and Scotland and Ireland, Northern Ireland. And I think we're starting to see that fragment now. Um, we can cut the data and we have cut the data by region. At the moment, there are no significant differences between the regions. But if you go on to our lovely interactive dashboard, which the lovely Chris unit has developed, 
um, you can see where there are differences. And it will be really interesting, I think, to see as the data continues and as those policies diverge, whether there is any difference in, in, in audience opinion as a result of that. And we will absolutely be able to see that. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. T to the top, oh, and to Scotland, Kenny. Kenny McKinnon asks, um, a lot of our individual responses, so I take it that Kenny, you, you, were, you were a participant, stated they would only return once a vaccine or cure is available. Is this something that was reported consistently? Well, Kenny, I'm very sorry, but I haven't had time to go through all the comments uh, because they're free text fields. Um, but yes, that's something that a number of people have said to me. And in fact, we are going to vary, we're going to change question, one of the questions in the when will audiences return section for version two. So it will still ask whether you would feel comfortable coming to events as soon as venues are allowed to reopen. But then the following two questions will be about whether you would be prepared or prepared to consider going to a venue if they had social distancing in place or whether you were just going to stay away until there was a vaccine or cure. So we will actually have some data on that um, in version two. Okay and then just comments on that one Carol Rayner um, a lot of her, she says a lot of her response said that as well and Karen Nichols says this is similar to results in the US with similar surveys so thank you for that Kenny. We've got 40 questions in the Q&A, so if you're going to have a dive in there, can you have a look through and give them a thumbs up, um, uh, ones that you think are particularly relevant, because we may not get a chance to get through all of these. Um, now, I to, I'm like a newsreader now, I'm having to read this at the same time as speaking. Um, this Caroline says, this is brilliant, however, I haven't sent this out yet, because I, as a mailing list subscriber of other venues, I have received this survey at least twice slash three times. I'm wondering if it might be damaging to our audiences to over survey them if they receive it from other venues, what do other people think. And I'll I'll come to you maybe for a comment on that, uh, Katie, but it'd be interesting people can put comment, people can comment on that. So Caroline's currently top of the pile. So maybe people want to put their comments on where they think about it. What do you think about it, Katie? Well, what we have said, we've had a few um, London organisations join recently and because we know in London lots have sent it out and we know there's massive crossover between loads of the venues in London, we have actually suggested that they put something in the covering email to say, you know, if you've received this from another venue, please don't feel you need to complete it. And because we had to limit the number of responses per organisation to a thousand, um, we're recommending people don't send out more than about three or four thousand anyway because they're getting such high response rates um so actually losing a few people who go okay well i've already filled this in isn't isn't going to damage your results um, and hopefully make them feel a bit better about about not filling it in three times yeah i think i was on the um international ticketing association's wednesday call just a couple of nights ago Hello, Tiffany and Peter from Intix, who are on the call. Um, and, you know, they were, there was a talk of, you know, um, survey fatigue because, you know, where there'd been individual surveys by venues, that, that there was a feeling that there was survey fatigue going on. But uh, um, any question, any comments on Caroline's question there, put, put, go head to Q&A and you can comment on that there. Lucy Hughes, next up, um, does anyone, it's, 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 a, it's a asking for, for, for discussion really, so again it may be better if you want to put this on Twitter or you can put it as a, as a comment, everyone who's still on the call. Does anyone know of any research looking into people turning to arts and culture during lockdown? Um, so that's a really interesting question from Lucy. Uh, Katie, do you know anything on that? Uh, yeah, there's a few. I'm going to um, send out uh, some links to some other studies that are doing either similar or um, complementary things. And one of them, uh, one of them is about digital activity during lockdown. Um, I was a little disappointed to see that cultural stuff wasn't as high in the mix there in terms of the questions they were asking. They only asked about two. It was mostly about reading e-books and gaming and stuff. Um, but there were a couple of them in there. Um, and so I will send the link to that out um, to those who I'm going to be in contact with next week, because um, it's quite an interesting piece of work around around that. And there's definitely something in there about it. 
Okay, superb. Uh, quick comment from Ron, uh, Robin Peters. No question, but a huge thank you uh, to all of you taking uh, who've done this. This information is completely invaluable. So thank you very much, Robin, for that comment. Ooh, um, you may have answered this, but I'm going to read it. Cat Collins, uh, have you considered surveying the venues themselves to ask how they feel about social distancing or managing or welcoming back audiences? No. I haven't because there are loads of surveys asking venues that um, loads of them already from various bodies. So I didn't want to get embroiled in that. I'm focusing purely on the audience, but there are lots and lots of those. OK, so that's something, you, something you're staying clear of in this one. Yeah. OK. Um, Peter, Peter Anson. Hello, Peter. Uh, good question here. Uh, and, you know, and, and he, he, he nails this because we've seen such movement in the UK, different parts of the UK in the last couple of weeks. As time moves on, people's views change. How frequently will the survey be done um, testing the views? If people keep asking you questions, that's moving down my screen. Um, with the same question. So, you know, you know, is there, a, is there a thought to, to change the frequency given the fact attitudes may shift? Yes, and some of the, um, some of the venues and organisations are using the same link and sending it out in waves so that they're getting, you know, they're getting weekly results coming in and that's perfectly possible to do. And of course, because it's such a massive data set, even though the organisations, most of them did only send it out once to their audiences, because we've had data flowing into the data set and it because it's so huge and it's, it's a fairly homogenous group in terms of the profile. I think if there are big changes in, in audience sentiment, we will start to see those and we're tracking it week on week. But yes, yeah, some of the organisations have been doing that and because they can see their results in real time, they can just go on every day or every week and pull off the results and, and then compare them and track them. Okay, okay, thank you very much for that one. Um, and while we're here, we might as well do Peter's other question. Is the data mainly from theatres, uh, question mark, have arenas, gigs, venues, and others been asked to participate or ticket agents who sell a range of venues? Um, it's it's fifty percent from theatres, twenty nine percent from art centres. So they are mostly venues. Um, I'm in dialogue with uh, somebody who thinks they might want us to repurpose this for arenas, and I'd be very interested in doing that because I think that would be a different sort of demographic. Um, and I believe there are a few ticket agents who've sent it out as well, uh, but that but not very many. It's mostly been venues with a direct relationship with their audience. Okay, and Lisa comments on that as well. Outdoor festival organisers and attenders would be interesting too. Um, right, let's go, who's top of the pile? So Caroline's still top of the pile and people are commenting on her question there that was about a fatigue of, of, of surveys. Um, Kerry Evans asks, could we ask customers about how they feel attending small participatory work, art classes, youth theatre, dance classes, etc. I was on the call with the CEO of a music centre today, talking about how they've seen a real shift from performance to uh, participation and, and, and also streaming as well. So what do you think about that, Katie? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it needs to go on our list of, you know, other formats to investigate in version two to sort of say, OK, to what extent would any of these be interesting? Uh, you know, especially looking at people doing them for the first time or, or sort of st stepping out of their their comfort zone and, and trying out. And I think we need to try and find out how attractive those other options are. OK, this is a good one. I like this one. And it's to do with. Um, People's drivers. So Richard Howell asks, is it possible to find out what the driver is in an audience in deciding whether to ask for a refund or exchange or move into another performance? Hmm. That's an interesting one. I'd have to think carefully about how we would do that, but I think it's a great question. Definitely something that we need to try and find out the answer to. Yeah, I think that's I think that's an absolutely great one. The research I've seen and, and from the, the system providers and and looking at different sectors about the, the 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 success in turning people into a straight donation or a um, a switch is a very good question. Thank you for that, Richard. Oh, 
the Q, after all that, the Q&A has gone up by four. So uh, we need to get it a bit, I think, going a bit quicker, actually. Um, right, here we go. Uh, Ruth, very quick one. Do you recommend sending version two to the same data set to measure the change in attitude? And is it possible to track who those respondents were, Katie? Uh, the answer to the second bit is no, because we were fully GDPR compliant, you'll be pleased to know. Um, we deliberately turned off any way of identifying people, including their IP address. So um, you will obviously know who you sent it to before. If you want it to send, send it to the same people again, you can. But of course, you don't know whether they're the same people that will answer it. Personally, I think um, if you go for a similar profile of people, um, you're likely to be able to track um, the, you know, it's not the same people, but you, if you've got, you know, if you've got three, if you've got a thousand responses, that is an, a mega sample um, of your audience. So I think if even if you sent it to a different thousand people, as long as they were selected on the same basis as the first lot, I think it would be valid to compare them. Okay, uh, thanks. That sorry, I, I, I muted myself because I was I was trying to type some text answers to clear to clear this list down. Um, I just saw I've gone to the bottom of the pile because I think sometimes that you find some questions here that. Um, you know, or in a little sector. Uh, Claire asks, um, she, wanted, she wants to be able to, to you know, look at fringe theatre audiences. Is that possible? Uh, in terms of survey fringe theatre venues, it, it all depends whether you've got the data. Uh, some organisations, if they don't have data, but they have good social engagement, have put the link out on their social channels and had good engagement that way. Um, so if they don't actually have the email addresses or the GDPR permissions, then that might be a way of doing that. Superb, superb. Right. Sorry, can I just go back to the survey fatigue thing? Because it's coming um, up again. It is coming up again, yes. Yeah, um, I, I, I know it's, I, I'm the first one to be complaining that people over survey audiences and it's usually the soapbox that I'm on. I think in this case, um, the, the feedback I've had from organisations is that audiences are so pleased to be asked, they want to feel like they're doing something to help, and we haven't seen the response rates go down, um, even in the organisations that perhaps are the third organisation in their area to send it out. So that would suggest that audiences are being rather forgiving at the moment and prepared to do it, and, and maybe they want to answer it for each of you so that each of you gets the information that you need. Interesting. Yeah, so, so, I think it's the biggest, the biggest question that call currently threads of conversation going on are about fatigue in here. Um, uh, another bit of anonymous. Um, I'd be interested in to find out if people that are watching online performances are going to carry on doing it, and if digital is going to be that big for our future. So that's an interesting thread for us all uh, to yeah, keep an eye. We'll get some clues to that from the answers in the next one, I think. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm whizzing through trying to find questions that are uh, a bit different. And a couple of things, uh, let's go out of, outside the UK. Rainer, um, uh, Rainer Glapp, um, he's done some research in Germany and he's also already put that on Twitter, hashtag after the interval. So you can, you can pick that up in, in Twitter. And then I also saw somewhere else, Martin Gamaltoft from Denmark. And he says a bit of positive in Scandinavia, the attitudes are changing very rapidly as restrictions are lifted without the number of cases increasing. Um, so good news. Thank you, Martin, for that. And he's got a great site, wewillrecover.live. Um, some great resources and learning and sharing of information on that. So that's wewillrecover.live. Um, oh. There's so many questions here. Right, Andy Kite, would it be possible to have some bespoke benchmarks set up specifically to venues similar to your own in terms of programme and capacity? It's possibly an agreement with these to have more tailored and comparable data set to your own. Yes, it's all possible. Um, I might need to charge something for it. because. <laughs> Um, but if there are groups that of, of, of venues or organisations who are happy to be part of a benchmark together and they're all in agreement that they, they're happy to be part of that, then that's all possible. Great, great, great. Um, 
Uh, Anonymous, we weren't involved this first time around, but really would like to be involved. Are you planning another round? Yes, um, says Ed. He's answering for you. And he says, we sent ours out yesterday. Um, and um, yes, it's on the Indigo website, um, which uh, is, if you search Indigo Limited or look at the Twitter of at Indigo Limited. Got that right, didn't I, Katie? Yeah, that's fine. So you can join in with this survey. Uh, which will run um, in, for another two weeks. Um, and then we're hopefully going to be able to launch version two to be used from end of May, early June. We're trying to, so basically we're trying to do it so we've got a six week block of this, this survey and then start asking some of these other questions as well as tracking some of the same metrics all the way through. Um, okay. Question from Rachel, and I think you think I think you kind of covered this, but but just in case, on behalf of the cinema manager, what I'd like to see in or her cinema manager, what I'd like to see in another survey would be if it meant you could attend a performance, would you wear a face masks uh, either when you were moving around the venue or during the performance or both? Yeah, so I think. Yeah, that's in my list of things to add for the kind of what I'm trying to do with the social distancing bit in version two is to work out what are the things people would expect and what are the things to what extent would they kind of see that as unpalatable. So masks for staff and masks for audiences, I think we need to put on that list. Okay. Um, and the list has gone up again to 47. So we're not going to get, unfortunately, folks, we're not going to get um, through all these. Uh, a quick one from Peter. North America, Katie, are you open to uh, opening up to North American venues or are you kind of focusing on this UK Ireland at the moment? At the moment, it's just UK and Ireland. If someone will pay me to do something in America, I'd be very happy to do it, but I don't have the resource at the moment to do any wider than UK and Ireland. I know how you feel because just running <laughs> webinars is breaking me at the, <laughs> at the moment. Um, Marie Archer, can we do drive-in cinema in the next? And Raina chips in with you know drive-in events generally. Yeah, good idea. I'll add it to the list. Thank you. This is this is this is, this is research in itself, isn't it? Great, great. This is an interesting one. Chris Claytor Scott, and I'm halfway down the list at the moment if you're trying to find this question. Is there the possibility of asking the people who took part in this survey, which I take it we don't know because of GDPR, to take part in some trials of socially distancing in venues once we reopen? That's a really interesting question. What's your thoughts on that, Katie? I think, I think people would be willing, you know, obviously, you, it would only be people who were not in a vulnerable category but yes I would have thought, I mean obviously we can't identify the people who took the survey but the individual organizations will know who they sent it to um, and and even if they didn't complete the survey if they were in that group and you contacted them to say would you be interested in helping us with a bit of a trial I think that's a really good idea um, and I, I, I suspect from the sort of supportive comments we've had from audiences through the survey that you would get uh, uh, enough people who wanted to do that a uh, quick question slash comment from Hannah, um, and we've I've heard a lot about well we can reopen with social distancing plans and face masks, but I can't get a glass of wine. She flips it the other way and says many venues operate cafes and bars which underwrite their activity. Could it be asked if local patrons would support these, even if shows weren't on? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. It, yeah. it is, isn't it? It's a different approach. I, think I like I like that thinking that they'll be different. It's not all well. A lot about what goes on the stage or you know in the auditorium but it's an interesting one yeah right now down. this is a, do you want to get contentious now katie yeah. right karen nickel she, she, she says who's going to take the information from this survey and present it to the policy makers and government slash national funders i've sent it to the arts council they've got it good that's done done let's move on um if you sell a performance with socially distant seating plans and we find out restrictions are relaxed, would you open up the remaining held capacity and then re-contact the bookers to advise them of a change in seating? Uh, now, yeah. I mean, to be honest, well, to be honest, but if I, if, if I bought before all this, I bought two seats, leaving two seats between you and who you were going with, Katie, and then they get filled. I don't think I don't think you have to ring me to tell me that you've sold seats next to well, me. And I think 
my personal view on this is that if we if you're trying to do socially distanced uh, seating, my personal view is that you shouldn't be selling it off a seating plan and you should be selling tickets for an area of the building because you just don't know. Half of us can't get into our buildings to even measure them up to see what's two metres away from anything. So I think selling the, the up to the, what you think the minimum is for that area and then if it's general admission, um, you, can, you can flow people in and, and sit them socially distance. And if it turns out that your seats, actually you could, you could seat people with two seats in between or one seat in between as things change, you can then flex that as you go forward. And what you might be doing in terms of your models for uh, November might be very different from what you're doing in March. So my personal view is that you just don't want to be selling off a seating plan at all. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, quick one from Hannah, which I think is in there already. Is there any way to split the data to see the difference for audiences over 65? Because my audiences are older. Um, yes, uh, I have looked at that across the whole data set. And let me just get it in front of me. There is very little difference apart from um, the only differences by age were uh, that they're going to book later, a, a higher proportion of them say it will be at least four months before they think about booking. So all, yeah, almost half of them saying that uh, compared with a quarter of under 35s. Um, and fewer of them saying just seeing venues reopen would make them feel comfortable to come back. So only 14% of them said uh, just venues reopening. Other than that, there were very few differences. Um, other than weirdly, Hand sanitizer was more important to young people than it was to old people. So work that one out. Interesting, interesting. Um, I, I'm going to start just below the, the, the top rank questions because they're more comments at the moment. I'm going to jump into Doug's question. Hello, Doug. Would it be worth, I'm going to summarise this. He asked about attitudes and whether, whether we consider different scenarios. So if, if, for example, we didn't have um, social distancing plans and we don't have masks there'll be no live art through until 2021 so and then so if that was the scenario do we give them two scenarios and then look at the differences in their attitudes between wearing masks or not wearing masks yeah I think we need to we need to think very carefully about how we're trying to answer these questions but I think they're all trying to get to the same thing aren't they so that's a bit of a challenge for me next week to figure out how to do that in version two but thank you Doug. yeah uh, there's a question about from Chris about sharing digital content and how we feel about digital and for me we've had a lot of inquiries from or people putting ideas for webinars about digital content we've got one coming up a week after the next about emailing in the in the world of digital content and how do we, do we change our emailing um uh activities when we when we're selling digital content rather than than live performance um we're not going to get through all these q and a's it's gone up to 50 now um so i think if we if we're going to take five or six more katie do you think yeah um i know unfortunately both of us have um, other things going on about half past three so um let's have a look i'm going to try and be as random as possible here um doug's already asked one ben um is there any value in asking some more hypothetical questions about what situation we are facing nationally regarding the virus and how people people's people's opinions change on how that develops. For example, if the national virus outcomes improve quickly and the media narrative becomes more positive, it might be a more positive outlook. So are we link are you linking anything to like media and, and how they're they're, they're feeling generally no, outside of the theatre? The view that I took, rightly or wrongly, on this survey, right from the start was I want to gather information that cultural organizations can actually do something with themselves. So all the kind of macro stuff that's out of their control, interesting though it is, I took the decision that that'll all be interesting. It'll be in that kind of nice, but nice to know, but what the hell do we do with it kind of category. And I focused very clearly on, okay, so here's what we know and here's what we can do with it. You know, if, if people are saying they need hand sanitizer, we can do something about that. 
Um, there are some interesting other studies on that stuff, which I think it's worth looking at in tandem with this data. And as I say, I've compiled a list of the other kind of research studies that I think are interesting that are complementary to this. And I'll, I'll circulate those so that you can look at them because there are some things in there that deal with that. Um, but I think I had to be quite pragmatic about asking the questions we could do something about and also making sure the survey didn't take half an hour to fill in. Yeah, I think that again, going back to that whole thing of, of, of um, digital, um, digital fatigue. Good question from Kate here. Uh, she says, hi, Katie. If you're working in a venue now, what's the first thing that you would action on seeing this data? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't be putting shows on sale anytime soon. Um, the first thing I would action, I would sort out my ticket exchanges. That's the first thing I would sort out. If I was a marketer, I'd be going, heck, I've got to put some shows on sale here and nobody's going to blum and well book for these unless I can give them some reassurances about the ability to exchange or have, the, have credit for their tickets. So for me, that'd be really high. So when you say exchanges, you mean the policy, the clear stated policy? Yeah, and also the, the tools to do it. You know, the, how easy is it to go onto Amazon and say, I'm returning this thing? I want to be able to do that with tickets. I want to be able to log on and go, I want to return my tickets. I understand that you'll put it in credit, you know, that it'll sit there and I can spend it on something else, but I want it to be that easy. I don't want to be hanging on the phone for half an hour to speak to somebody and then plead with them to exchange my tickets. Yeah, yeah, I completely get that. Um, time for a couple more. Um, Tara Sanders asked, is there a way to incorporate how audiences feel about the rescheduled performances in a similar to when would they be when would they be willing to come back? But what's the earliest date they would be happy for a performance to be rescheduled for? I think that's in there already, isn't it? Well, it's sort what? of... I mean, one is one is about is about parting with cash, isn't it? It's about when would you be like happy to book again and actually spend some money on something speculatively. Uh, the other is about when you'd be able to come back. So I think I think we can sort of infer that. Um, okay. Okay. We're not going to get. All, I'm sorry, folks. We're just not going to get through all these questions. I think we may have to. If Katie and I can schedule some time, maybe try and have a another session at some point. Um, Sarah Gent says, big thank you to Katie and Indigo team for putting all this together. Um, two more, come on, let's find two more. Um, a lot of these are just thank yous, which is really, or, or just thank yous, but it's nice to have a thank you. Well done, Katie, this is an amazing piece of work. And that's from me, not even a question on the, on the Q&A. David Thomas, um, are there any plans for listing more qualitative data from online service and focus group. That's really interesting. Any plans for quality data? Well, I mean, what we have done in this is we've allowed some uh, some fields for customers to just tell us how they're feeling. Now, I've said to the individual organisations, they belong to them and I'm not looking at those. But I know a lot of the organisations who've taken part have said that actually that's some of the, you know, it's good to have the numbers, but that's been really valuable. And the kind of outpouring of support and emotion that's come through just those comments boxes on the survey has been has been quite overwhelming in some cases. Um, so I think that's really important to do. Obviously, with qualitative, it's a lot harder to then compare it. Um, and I think that will mean a lot more to the individual organisations themselves in reading that in conjunction with the um, with the numbers. OK, um, a couple more questions of is there or is it possible to um, can you do version two if you didn't do version one? You can. I'd encourage you to do version one in the next two weeks if you can, because I think you will then see you'll be able to track and you'll you'll have a, like a baseline and you'll also be able to use this data against your own data nothing to stop you taking part in both and um, but if you want to just wait till version two that's also fine okay last couple now caroline um she says we had a lot of comments about people feeling uneasy on public transport and the, the news in the bbc the the tv news in the uk was terrible i say pictures of people getting off buses what a shame uh, a bigger barrier for people than it was was that was that rather than attending attending the event itself did anyone else experience that quoted as, you know, public transport was the big worry? 
Yeah, it's on my list to go on the uh, to go in version two because I think that's becoming uh, a real issue. So I think we definitely need to ask something about that. Okay, um, and I'm going to try and find one last one. Um, Stefano, we're all we're all European. Stefano, are you willing to share the possibility of filling the form to other European countries? He's from Italy. Yes, let's talk. Get into yeah, it. and then Joe. Hello, Joe. You're you are very late, young lady in um, in Brisbane. Um, who asked? She's from Australia, obviously, in being in Brisbane, uh, and she'd be interested as well. So there's a lot of interest from around the world, Katie. This well done. It's a superb piece of work. Wow, thank you, folks. I'm really sorry. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Um, I think um, we will. Katie and I will chat about trying to maybe come back and, and, and have a, a, a rework of this or, or a bigger discussion online because we're still getting questions asked now. They're still at 51, so thank you very much. Um, there's some more TPC content online. Um, hashtag after the interval questions and comments uh, for Katie or myself. We're, we're pleased to answer those as we get into the weekend. But thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for the work and thank you for coming on the webinar. Thanks all. Lovely to hear you all, or not, as it were, but see you on the text. <laughs> and we will see you all again shortly. So thanks again for attending. Thank you.